got issues. This arc you, it's painted. Yeah, no shit, it is. They conserve copper during World War II. That's why there's no rivets? That's why no rivets. How the fuck do you not know that? Because I fucking don't. This is original Big E Red Line Selfage, all right? From 1944. You can get twelve fifty for that on eBay tonight. And I'd still be five and a half short. Add this. What am I, a coin star? That's like three hundo, Three hundo plus what? Plus the 1955 blanket line type three. Pleated? Pleated. Is this what it's like to have someone on TV write about the thing you're passionate about? It, just, it hurts. Do legal dramas get like this kind of stuff wrong all the time too? My god. I might not be a professional chef, but I am a professional denim nerd. But first I want to make a distinction. This trade here is in vintage denim. We all have that friend, coworker, or person that you vaguely associate with who is really into raw <laughs> denim, dark indigo denim that they wash infrequently to naturally create fades where the indigo dye breaks down. They probably keep their jeans in the freezer too, like a gullible chump who reads too many articles about how to get the best fades. Well, I am that chump. Not the freezer part, that's stupid, we've proven that it doesn't work, but the real freaks in the denim community are those who trade, date, and value vintage jeans, and that is what's happening here. So let's set the scene. Carmi here is trading some of his collection of vintage jeans and jackets, which he keeps in the oven, as all of us do, for beef needed to run the restaurant. A restaurant that he inherited from his now deceased brother, which is having financial problems. You've been here for two weeks. We've been having money problems for two weeks. One plus one equals you're an asshole, Bobby Don't call Flay. me Bobby Flay. Very weird, but I mean, you know, Chicago, right? We got issues. This arcuate's it's painted. All right, so the arcuate is the name of the kind of stitched swirl pattern that's on the back of every pair of vintage Levi's jeans. I mean, the modern ones too. But the way that the arcuate is done is used to help date vintage jeans. And the way that you kind of like date these details is what helps you determine the year or like vague years that it was produced. And that is what kind of helps to produce a kind of value. The painted arcuate is an interesting one because it is exclusively done during World War II when they were conserving not just copper but kind of all materials. And Levi's was told to stop stitching the arcuate, but they thought it was so valuable to their brand that they decided to paint it instead. What's actually really interesting though is that most of the time the paint has faded away. So when you sell a pair of vintage Levi's jeans that are World War II era, they generally don't have anything on the back pocket. If you had a pair of jeans that still had the painted arcuate on it, it would be worth way more than one in which the paint has faded away. Yeah, no shit, it is they conserve copper during World War II. That's why there's no rivets? That's why no rivets. We're gonna get back to the whole conserving copper thing later, because uh, that took me for a whole spin. But yes, copper was part of the conservation effort and Levi's reduced their usage. However, they didn't remove all the rivets. They removed the rivets from the center of the crotch seam, the coin pocket, and they removed the back strap entirely, which was secured by two rivets and had a metal buckle. That's why there's no rivets? That's why no rivets. How the fuck do you not know that? Because I fucking don't. Like, honestly, that is a fair question because the World War II era Levi's jeans are some of the easiest to identify. You're much more likely to get into an argument about its authenticity authenticity than you are about why it's painted at all. I personally wouldn't trade with a guy who asked me why it's painted, but then again, I don't need to support my dead brother's sandwich shop with my jean habit. This is original Big E Red Line Selfage, all right? From 1944. You can get 1250 for that on eBay tonight. All right, so Big E Red Line Selvage. The Big E refers to the little red tag that goes on the back pocket of the jeans. The E was changed to a lowercase in 1971, so if it's Big E, that means that it's before 1971. All right, so red line selvage. Selvage is the self edge. On old school shuttle looms, which is what they would have been using at the time, the weft thread, which goes horizontally in the fabric, would go to the end and then wrap around when it made its return journey to the other side. And that would create the self edge, a very clean finish. Projectile or shuttleless looms introduced to the commercial garment industry in 1953 cut the yarn with each pass, producing a feathered fabric edge more than six times as fast and generating fabric twice as wide. Levi's switched to a fabric mill using shuttleless looms in 1985 because it was cheaper, eliminating the selvage. So we use selvage as a kind of signifier of the way that it used to be done. It doesn't make the denim high quality, it just means that it's made on a shuttle loom. The red line in red line selvage is the selvage ID, a colored yarn next to the fabric edge. Different fabric mills place different colors there, mostly just for fun, but between 1927 and 1985, Cone Mills produced a selvage denim with a red fabric ID that was the exclusive denim of the Levi's 501. So that's all fine and dandy, but these details don't really help to confirm 1944. They do help with authenticity if Meat Boy here was asking for authenticity, which he isn't. But then we get to the price. You can get 1250 for that on eBay tonight. 
See, I don't know, World War II era jeans in good condition can go for $6,000 according to Heedles. So yeah, you could easily get $1250 same day, but you could also get much more than that, especially if this pair has an intact painted arcuate. That'd be American. I am Canadian, but I'm kind of doing this in the, you know, we're in Chicago. We're pretending we're in Chicago right now. And I'd still be five and a half short at this. What am I, a coin star? That's like 300, 300 Gigi. plus what? Plus 1955 blanket line type 3. Pleated? Pleated. Boom. And again, that's that's fine. I guess. I've been hurt enough at this point to just accept it. I'll break it down fully, but first, that jacket doesn't exist. The Type 3 didn't exist in 1955. While its launch date is a matter of discussion, it's been estimated to be as early as 1962, but Levi's themselves dates it to 1967. The Type 3 being the third style of denim jacket that Levi's produced. This here is a recreation of a Type 1. Now, a Type 1 generally has a single pocket and these pleats here on the front. They also have a back cinch. This here on the back, that makes it a type one. A type two would not have the back cinch, but still has the pleated back and still has the pleated front. And instead you would have like little button adjusters on the side here. This here is a type three jacket. And this here on the front, we kind of identify most of the time as having this kind of V stitch on the front. It's made from more panels than it is from a type one or type two. But that's the type three. We also call it the trucker jacket. It is pretty much the one most of us think of these days as the denim jacket. Started in 1967, allegedly, and up to this day, it is pretty much the most popular style currently in production. Plus 1955 blanket line type three. Pleated? Pleated. Boom. You can't have a pleated type three. It doesn't exist. The defining feature of the type three is the lack of pleats. A jacket which we find out later was a gift from his brother. You know, the dead one? Yeah, I need that uh, jacket that Mike gave me. Yeah, look, can you, uh, can you bring it here? Yeah. All we see of the jacket is this brief shot, so we don't really see the chest detail. But it looks like a Type 3 since the pocket flap integrated into the chest yoke seam is a very typical Type 3 detail. It's not really clear how much this meat is worth, but they're definitely making it seem like Carmi's really selling his entire collection. I mean, it must be the case if he's resorting to that jacket, even though he closed the oven with jeans still inside, I don't know. But I see what they're trying to do. He's hit rock bottom and is putting everything he has into the restaurant and his vintage jeans collection is the last thing he can sell of any value. The jacket being his last big sacrifice. It could have been perfect, you know? Just fix a couple words here and there, clarify the values and the scope of this trade, and you could really sell that Carmi has given everything for this restaurant. Overall though, I'm, I think it was fine. They got pretty much everything wrong when you get to the finer details, but I mean, I don't see this deep of a dive into denim culture very often. When I watched it for the first time, I scoffed a bit at the pleated type 3, but more than anything, I was just happy to see this weird subculture I'm in represented. Overall though, I thought the show was great, and I highly recommend it. Also, if you've endured my incessant indigo dad ramblings up until now, then I did promise to elaborate on... We got issues. This arcuate's painted. Yeah, no shit is they conserve copper during World War II. That's why there's no rivets? That's why no rivets. So copper isn't involved in the production of cotton or polyester thread to my knowledge. So this transition is just kind of awkward and doesn't really make any sense. Is Carmi expecting this guy who doesn't know about the painted arcuate to make the connection between copper conservation during World War II and just the overall materials conservation and heightened prices? Or is he misunderstanding copper's role in thread production? And so I confirmed copper is not part of thread production, but it is a part of dyeing. Not cotton or polyester though. Copper sulfate is used as a mordant. Essentially, it helps colors stick to fabrics or threads, but copper sulfate is used on animal fibers like wool and silk, not cotton and polyester. Other mordants are used for cotton and polyester, but they don't involve copper. I mean, that was just a cool little piece of side information that I happened to stumble across, but like, it seems like an awkward transition. Not that that's terribly important. Look, overall, I loved The Bear. I thought it was a fantastic show, and when I watched it the first time and I just sit casually back and see them talk about denim, I get happy because like they're talking about this thing that is one of the most passionate things in my life. And even if they get a couple details wrong, it doesn't really hurt the show and it doesn't hurt me and it didn't stop me from continuing to watch it. A, a quick little, little side thing, like I do like to cook, you know, I love cooking. And they make this whole big deal in the first episode about Carmi missing his knife. And when he finds his knife, we see that it is a Japanese carbon steel chef's knife. And a quick note on uh, carbon steel, I actually have one right here. Uh, this is my carbon steel knife. And carbon steel, unlike uh, stainless steel, I just feel 
menacing, just like waving this knife around. Um, carbon steel takes on a patina over time. So carbon steel is harder and holds a sharper edge than stainless steel, but also is more prone to rust and discoloration, and because it's harder, if you drop it, it's more likely to shatter. As long as you keep it from rusting, it develops a patina discoloration over time, and there's just something that's very denim about that, taking something and making it yours through use. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you learned something, and if you haven't already, check out The Bear, it is a fantastic show. Like, subscribe, and all that business, and I'll see you next time.